Hello, I'm Chuck Wolf, Chief Executive for Charles J. Wolf Associates, LLC. As a motivational speaker and a leadership consultant, and executive coach and trainer, I often work with very successful people in their companies. Since many can't afford a professional, I volunteer to host a radio talk show called The Emotion Roadmap, Take the Wheel and Control How You Feel, on a nonprofit community radio station in Bridgeport, Connecticut, WPKN. My reason for doing the show is to share with as many people as possible this wonderful process for helping people manage their own emotions and their relationships with others. My goal is for everyone listening to learn to use the Emotion Roadmap to make life better. As you listen to me, help others, I hope you are also learning. As a Simsbury resident, I'm delighted to be able to make the show available through Simsbury TV. To learn more, go to my website, www.emotionroadmap.com. Thank you for listening and watching. You're listening to Chuck Wolf. This is the Emotion Roadmap. Take the wheel and control how you feel. And I'm really pleased to have as a guest Judy McLaughlin, who I've known for a number of years. Let me tell you a little bit about Judy. She's um, uh, she's doing work for a number of years now on helping new leaders of universities and colleges to take the reins. And uh, let me give you a bit of her background. This is at Harvard University. So Judith Block McLaughlin's work focuses on leadership and governance in higher education. As educational chair of the Harvard Seminar for New Presidents and the Harvard Seminar for Experienced Presidents, she's had the pleasure of working with over 1,000 college and university presidents since the program's inception in 1990. She's written and consulted extensively on leadership transitions, presidential assessment, board president relationships, senior staff functioning, and board governance. In 2007, she was appointed by Governor Deval Patrick in Massachusetts to serve as the chair of the Massachusetts Public Education Nominating Council, the body that nominates trustees for the state's colleges and universities. Prior to Harvard, she was dean of student affairs at two colleges, executive director of the National Academy of Education, and a high school social studies teacher. Um, and Judith, if you could tell us a little bit uh, more about the role that you've played, how you got to be in that role. We were doctoral students together back a number of years ago at Harvard. And how did you transition to become this, to become the person who is helping new presidents uh, take the reins in their respective universities? Well, I think, um, like a lot of people, my interest in leadership transitions came from my own direct experience. Before I came to Harvard, I was, as you said in my profile, I was a dean of student affairs at two different colleges, and before that I worked in student affairs at a low-level residence life at yet a third place. And in all three institutions, either right before I came or during the time I was there, there was a presidential search and a leadership transition at the presidential level. And I became fascinated at the ways that these were openings for an institution into many questions about the institutional mission, about the institutional needs, and of course about the person who would be taking the helm of the institution. So my own research looked at presidential searches, and in the course of that I was talking with people who had been successful in the search, the new presidents, and realized that they were eager to have a place to talk as the only person in that role on their campus, especially when they were new. They had lots of questions, some areas of doubt about their own performance because they were new at this, and wondered about dimensions of their role. And yet, as new presidents, didn't have a place to go with those feelings and those issues and those questions. And so when we created the Harvard Seminar for New Presidents, the idea was really to get people together at the same stage in their career. All the folks in the Seminar for New Presidents are first-time presidents, and that's important. So they come into this with a powerful motivation to do well, and with the kind of newness and questions that anyone starting a job would feel. And so this provides them both with a group of colleagues with whom to raise those questions, to share their concerns, to think aloud, and a group of subject matter experts and experienced presidents who can help them think about the questions and think about their own institutions. 
So it really was addressing what at that point felt like a need in the field. And the program started in 1990 with, I think it was 36 presidents that year. We cap it now at 50 um, and have no problem filling it. So clearly there was a need there, and we're delighted to be able to help with that. It's interesting, uh, Judy, when it, when we were there at that um, in, in the 80s, um, or the end of 79 or 80, the, the, one of the things that I got to do is I worked with a fellow named Tony Athos at Harvard Business School and the Executive Program for Management Development. And mm-hmm. um, that was their nine-month program for managers who were <laughs> kind of transitioning. From, but they didn't always. They, Tony asked me to do a little bit of research. It was informal. It was never published. But he asked me to send out a questionnaire to all the people that had taken it. And one of the things that, w- that came back that was very clear was that the, the people who were about to take on general management responsibilities, in other words, a lot of people came to that who were ca- coming out of either strategy functions or coming mm-hmm. out of operations or finance, and that when they were coming in, they were the, the, those that were going to go back and become general managers and have all the pieces that they had to be responsible for found the program to be overwhelmingly powerful and important and successful. Others who went back into the current roles that they'd been in but just took time out to go through this learning, they, 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 uh, one person I thought captured it beautifully when he said it was kind of like the movie Flowers of Algernon, which, which um, was this person who was, ha- had a very low-level IQ and got some kind of drug that made him incredibly smart. <laughs> and then after a number of months went by, he began to realize that the drug was wearing off and that everything that he had learned was being lost and he was returning to his former state. And that's how some of the others felt who didn't have this. So the idea that the program that you have is for everybody who's moving into this, in a sense, general manager role, but it's, it's different, certainly. But, but they all have the same learnings that are important to them because the goal, I mean, while each institution, I'm sure, has its own unique challenges, some of the things that you list as, as objectives seem like they got to be common across all of them. Right. right. No, well, you, you said it very well, Chuck. I mean, we, we have defined the population that we serve as people who are first-time presidents, who are either starting in, in, the, in the typical academic calendar. A president will begin in July 1, and so the, the program is in early July, so most of the people in the program have just begun. And they can have, or they may have come in possibly during the course of an academic year up till the end of their first year. So the, the, the most experienced of this new group are people who are at the end of their first year. And we were aware that we were choosing presidents, first time presidents, you know, brand new. But we were going to have a wide range of institutions, and that is still the the way we operate. There are institutions that are two-year and four-year, public and private, institutions that have a very particular curricular focus, technology or divinity, religion, theological schools, and institutions that are comprehensive institutions, institutions that are research-based, institutions that are much more directly teaching-focused, high-prestige institutions that are universally known and institutions that I sometimes say are locally loved, um, but the name wouldn't mean anything to most people. Mm-hmm. Was that going to work? Was having somebody from the Air Force Academy and a community college in rural Massachusetts and um, Pomona and the University of Uh, Mississippi, and so forth, in one room going to make sense. It Hmm. does because they're all in this same situation where they are starting out with many, many questions and the only person in their institution in their role. What you said about the corporate leaders um, with whom you were working is so true in higher education that no matter how close people have been to the presidency, college university presidency, and I hear this repeatedly. They don't know what it really feels like to be the one person in charge of all these different areas and all these different constituencies and stakeholders who see the world very differently from their own perspectives 
and have divergent and sometimes competing or outright contradictory interests and desires for the institution and are both having to manage the ongoing processes of the institution and take care of the running of it on an ongoing basis, but be thinking about the long term and be strategic. And, be the kind, and then, on top of this, to be the symbol of the institution. My mentor at Harvard, David Reisman, used to call the president the living logo of the institution. And there is a way that there is a symbolic role. It's not just management or leadership. There is a symbolic role that is exceedingly important and very different from the jobs that people have had before. So what turns out to be this diverse group of institutions, the people come together because they are moving into this same new role, and they are so eager to find others who share their concerns, their questions, their excitement and anticipation, and their worries. Because after all, these are jobs that can turn out to be pretty precarious. Um, I've written a piece, I think you you mentioned it before we started this phone conversation, um, about comparing new presidents to divers who are standing at the end of the high diving board for the very first time. They've climbed, they've they've been off lower diving boards before and felt very comfortable doing it and have climbed up to the high dive, eager to take on this new level of skill and thrill. And yet at the moment they stand at the end of the high dive and look down, they're poised there to make that dive. They realize, first of all, when you're standing at the end of a high dive and look down, you don't just see the difference between the side of the pool and the high dive, you see all the way down to the bottom. So it's a lot longer fall than you realize. And you're very much aware that a belly flop, which is possible, no matter how good you were at lower levels, that a belly flop is both going to hurt like heck and going to draw much greater attention than a belly flop off the low diving board. And so at this point in their careers, they are aware that if, as a vice president, they didn't do so well and things didn't work out, they, if they were on the academic side, they went back to the faculty, they moved to another vice presidency elsewhere, and not many people were paying attention. At the presidential level, it can be very hard to recover from a failed presidency in part because of the dramatic attention that these will get. So there's a lot riding on these new presidents, and they feel it. Well, what are the, they should. One of the things that struck me when I was reading this article that you wrote about it, it, um, it you know, as I thought, well, belly flop and uh, and the perfect ten point dive, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is makes no noise and just makes very little, if any, splash. Um, that's different than I. It, it, does anybody show up and want to do a cannonball off the board? <laughs> oh yeah, that's, I love that. I had thought of that analogy. Yes, there are people who come in and want to do and. And and may, and by the way, some of their institutions want them to do something very dramatic very quickly. In some cases, there's a reason for that. It may be an institution that is, for a variety of reasons, in real trouble. There are institutions, as just as I said, presidencies can be precarious. There are institutions that, of course, are precarious. They are in financial difficulty, and their future, not not only their s- s- stability, but their very um, sustainability may be a question. And so they may feel a need to do something fairly dramatic quickly. There are other people who that's just who they are. They come in and they want to do things. They want to get things done. In some cases, I would say it's perhaps even because they think that's what as a leader they should be doing. The danger, of course, is that a belly flop can be a big splash, but it can also go badly. And for some institutions, doing something dramatic fairly early on may work if the stakeholders of the institution, the people at and around the institution, 
are on board with the idea. They believe it necessary. There is a sense of urgency. There's a sense that that the approach and the the change that's going to be put in place is something that people believe is is right for the institution. So it can be a case where a dramatic entry leads to a fairly dramatic failure. Hmm. So who who's attracted to this? I noticed in the article too. You you talked about there's very few young um, children early on in their lives that when they get asked what they want to do, say I want to grow up and become a college president. So I was struck by that too. And so mm-hmm. so what what is it about being college president that is is there a certain certain attributes that you've seen that sort of cut across the board, or is it very different from person to person? I do think it's different from person to person, but I would say one of the typical motivation is the feeling that you can make a difference in a kind of an institution that matters to the individual. They've come through higher education, they believe in its mission, but that also can matter to society, that our colleges and universities are places that can transform lives. And to engage in that work and to be a leader of that work and to make them even better than they are feels like a commitment and a motivation that spurs people into this job. They certainly take the job knowing that there are professional risks that may not work out. They take the job knowing it can be, typically is all-consuming in terms of the amount of energy it requires and time it requires. And they take these jobs not because um, they expect to be hugely compensated. I mean, uh, someone who goes to law school or in the corporate sector can become a CEO of a similar size institution, organization, and do much better. I'm not saying the presidents are poorly paid, but, but that's not for most people the motivation. So it's it's uh, it's about making a difference, and and um, I want to get into some of the challenges that they have. But at first, before we do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the program because uh, mm-hmm. you list a number of objectives, and I don't think people really understand a lot about what university presidents do necessarily. Mm-hmm. So there's the typical: you've got certain people that you have to manage. You're the personnel officer. You're also mm-hmm. an academic leader, which is different than other kinds of organizations. Uh, but then there's the relationship between the president and the board of trustees, and I tell ver- that many very many of my listeners have much understanding or background or knowledge about that. So maybe you could spend a little bit of time because that's really, I, I know in order to be successful, it looks like you're the person in charge, but you also have someone you report, not necessarily an individual you report to, but you report to a group uh, that's a board. And how does that work in, organiza- in, in academic life for organizations like universities? Well, that, that's one of the most interesting things because it's not a person. It would be much easier if it's, if it's a person, but it's a collection of people that, in whom legal authority for the institution is vested. The board of trustees are the people who hold the institution in their trust, and that's a legal um, group. And um, and so you're not reporting to one people. In, the, in a public institution, the typical size of a board is 12. It could be plus or minus. In a private institution, typical size is 32 but some are as high as 45 or 50. And for new presidents, for almost all of them, this is one of the most different aspects of their work than ever before because, you know, usually you have a a supervisor and you have a relationship with that supervisor and you talk on a kind of regular basis and, and you come to know what that individual wants. But both... But reporting to a group of people... Yes, there is a board chair, but that chair is only first among equals. Reporting to a group of people involves a kind of personal management, managing up in its own way. And it involves getting a group of people to reach agreement on important issues facing the college. And so it's very complicated. Um, And uh, in the best cases, the board serves as the wind at the president's back, is helping the institution to move forward, is supporting the president and enabling the president to be a strong leader. 
And in the worst cases, the board is standing in the way, is the wind in the president's face, making the job that much more difficult. So one of the key skills, it seems like, is, uh, and again, this is the this my show is called the Emotion Roadmap. Take the wheel and control how you feel. So if I'm if I'm looking at that and I'm talking to somebody who's a president of a university, one of the key things is, who are the key decision makers in that board? If you're dealing with 45 people, you can't be worried about every one of them in the same way. You probably, uh, at least I'm assuming that there's going to be some people that are going to be the drivers or the people that have the most influence anyway on that board, and those and are the yet, people you are going to build something. You're absolutely right, but you can't be neglecting. Others. Others. And so if you talk to a successful long-term president, they are often keeping a list of all the trustees, making sure that they touch base. Of course, they're sending out regular letters or emails to inform people, but they're also aware of the committees. Boards operate by committees, and they are aware of who's on the committees and talking with individuals. You don't want any of your trustees to become feel neglected or become disaffected. So it is a different kind of personal management than one normally thinks of because you think of personal management as managing the people who report to you and presidents do that. But it also is a is a awareness of working with this group of people who, by the way, are all volunteers. They are not there because they are compensated, other than the fact that they're compensated by feeling like they're doing important work, that they're contributing to an institution they care about, and that they're enjoying being part of a board. Um, But you've got this group of volunteers, and you expect those volunteers in private institutions and and now in public institutions, too, as to be advocates for and supporters of, and that includes financial support, of your institution. So they're people who matter. Of course, the only group that can hire and fire a president is the board. So you ignore trustees at your own peril if you're a president. Well, one of the other objectives on your list of uh, what the program teaches is is dealing with um, fundraising. And again, mm-hmm. that's not something. I mean, I, I know I, I I know something about you know the uh, higher academic um, lifestyle, and that certain people do get asked to do fundraising, even who aren't president. And so that's a skill that some come in with, but I imagine some mm-hmm. don't. And so that might be a, another. I mean, I, when I think of like what would I look for in terms of competencies in recruiting someone, it seems like uh, you have all these groups that are so powerful. You have the students, you have the faculty, you have the board, and you have alumni and donors, and mm-hmm. all these different groups. You have to understand emotionally what they need from you in order so they're going to be supportive of what your agenda is and hopefully Mm -hmm. uh, be the wind at your back, as you put it, as opposed Mm -hmm. to the wind in your face, which any one of these groups could be at different times, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course, to make it more complicated, none of those groups is, um, is, you know, completely homogeneous. So, uh, you know, you've got the faculty, but some of the faculty will hate you on one day and love you the next, and depending on the issue and You've got senior faculty, you've got adjunct faculty, so you've got different interests and different perspectives and different um, positions within any one of the constituents you talked about. But yes, um, to to talk about what presidents don't know, and you've mentioned trusteeship, and and very few people who come into the presidency have worked for the college board. That said, there are occasional presidents who have been trustees of that institution, which they're becoming the president, or of another institution, still, it's different to be the president reporting to a trustee than being a trustee. There are some presidents who come in with minimal fundraising experience, and yes, this is one of the biggies in terms of what their expectations are, and that's something they need to be learning. There are presidents who come in with strong administrative managerial backgrounds, but who themselves have never been faculty and who need to learn and understand the academic world and that those that perspective of the faculty member and really what are the key issues here. There are people who have been senior academic leaders and have worked, you know, to some extent with the board who know only a little bit about student life and athletics and Many of the issues that are tripwires in higher education now have to do with with areas of extracurricular life, whether it be 
concerns about um, sexual assault, concerns about student behavior around drinking, um, and so on. And so almost every presidency, every president who comes to our program has some gap, something that they have to learn. And by the way, we don't have second-time presidents in this program, but second-time presidents also have lots they have to learn. They may know what it feels like to be in the role of president, but the danger for them is they think they know that presidency. And each presidency is different because the context of the place that you are leading will shape the nature of that presidency. I see that's another bullet on your objectives about the importance of culture and traditions of of the particular institution you're going to be uh, leading. Absolutely. So, I, so as I look at what you do, it looks like there are some traditional things that show up in leadership programs, like the chief executive role and the senior personnel officer. Academic mm-hmm. leader is unique to, to higher mm-hmm. academics. But um, the role in, in strategic planning, culture, uh, performance mm-hmm. indicators, those are all traditional leadership roles. Mm-hmm. Now, again, you, you have them for six days. So can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about, I mean, I, I assume that the goal, you know, I think emotional goals for the program is that people live highly confident that they've worked on the areas where they need help and confident about their strengths going in and that they got recognized for those strengths and they confirmed that those indeed are strengths. So they want to mm-hmm. know that the skill set they're coming in with are is to really the skill sets that they have and they understand, but also that they've strengthened some of these areas that they may be new to them or at least the, mm-hmm. they may not be good at yet. And so mm-hmm. how does the, can you talk a little bit about how the program works to, to build that confidence? Yeah. Um, We spend a lot of time getting people to reflect on their own situation. So we can talk about development, but again, development, if you are in a community college, it has done very little of this in the past, or if you are at an elite independent college that has raised millions, maybe billions of dollars, is a very different picture. Do you have a sophisticated fundraising operation or are you starting basically from scratch? Mm, yep. So that part of what we are doing throughout is raising questions for people to be considering in light of their own institution. And part of the way they do that is by talking with each other. We we do introduce them, as I said, to subject matter experts. We introduce them to experienced presidents that we believe can be important resources to them. But among the most important resources are each other. And that uh, the, the many opportunities informally as part of the curriculum in small discussion groups, informally over during breaks, over meals, <laughs> that chance to talk with others and think aloud with others is hugely helpful in terms of building the kinds of relationships that will serve them well throughout their presence. That's very interesting because it seems to me nobody gets into this role that isn't an excellent critical thinker and really effective problem solver. So if you help them to get the questions right and they have some resources to explore what comes to mind for them as individuals, that creates the learning opportunity that you're talking about, not just during that week or so, but going forward because they've learned, they know what the questions are, even if they're not quite clear yet on all the answers. And they have a beginning thought about how, they might want to go about asking those questions back at their own institution. And I hope they deepened and widened those questions because I think, yes, that one, of the, one of the potential dangers for presidents is they were hired because they were so good, so effective at problem solving, at leading, at managing. And the temptation is to go in and do it, to take those problems and start solving them. But even people who are chosen from within the institution, and especially for those who are not, and in higher education, two-thirds, three-fourths are come from outside, don't really know the nature of the problem they're trying to solve. And they feel as if they should be solving it right away. And yet solving it too quickly may mean they're solving the wrong problem, or in a way that is the institution cannot support or accept. And so the danger is the jump reflex, as one of my colleagues here at Harvard once referred to it, the danger is moving too fast, too quickly, because you know 
that you want to address the problems, and you're somebody who has the energy and the interest and others looking at you, the expectation that you will do that. So it's intriguing to think about where how people get recruited for these jobs. Of course, I I know as I mentioned, I met, I know Peter Salovey, and when I met him, he mm-hmm. was he was originally the chairman of the psychology department, and then Absolutely. he was the, and then he was the dean of the graduate school of arts and sciences, and then he was the dean of Yale College, and then he was the I think the either provost or assistant at some level, but provost, and then he mm-hmm. was the president. So mm-hmm. that's highly unusual from what, what I know about colleges and universities, that you mm-hmm. take all those roles in one institution. So um, one of the things that I, I mentioned that I was uh, going to chat with you about was, so Larry uh, Larry Beckow was somebody that was working with you, I guess, in, in this program, mm-hmm. and then was the person that, after they looked all over the universe, that they found in their backyard that they wanted to make the new president. So you could tell us a little bit about Larry? Yeah, I'm delighted to. Um, I knew Larry when he moved in, into the presidency of Tufts in um, 2001. And he had been at MIT. His whole career had been a faculty member until his later years there, where he was asked to take on a, a senior administrative role they call chancellor. It's, it's what other places might call vice president for academic affairs, even provost. So he had this internal leadership role, but he never saw himself as an administrator. He always thought of himself as a faculty member. And when he began to do this work and was very good at it, it wasn't terribly surprising that an institution down the road, um, literally down the road here in in, um, Boston area, Tufts, saw his talents and called upon him. Larry has multiple degrees, and when he went to Tufts, there were actually academic departments fighting over who whose department he would officially be a member of, and I think he was a member of three or four different departments, his law degree, his economics degree, his area of public policy, and um, very much interested in environmental issues, and in his decade of the presidency at Tufts, he became a leader in the Boston community and, and in the country, and I quickly realized that and invited him to be on our faculty of the new president's program. When I say we have subject matter experts and experienced presidents, I appropriately choose presidents that I think are wonderful role models of leadership, and Larry certainly was that. When he, after a decade, he had made it known at the beginning he was going to stay 10 years and that he thought that was the right time for the president of the institution, when he was closing in on those 10 years, I went and asked if he would come over to the Graduate School of Education and teach with me. Uh, And he agreed to do that and spent three years that were just wonderful years where he and I shared a classroom. And I will tell you that I I felt like one of his students when he would talk about leadership. He's so, so smart and so thoughtful and so terrific to have. He's He is at heart a teacher, and one could see that when he was back with the graduate students here. He, during that, or actually just after he stepped down from Tufts, just in that period of time, he was asked to become a member of the Harvard Corporation. We talked about boards of trustees as a member of the senior governing board of Harvard. And that wasn't a surprise, because I said as he became a kind of a leader in the Boston higher ed community and leader in the nation, when Drew Faust, his predecessor at Harvard, became president, Larry was one of the first people who reached out to her as a new president in coming into the area. Larry reached out to her and invited her to dinner with Larry and his wife, invited Drew and her husband. And for Drew Fowles, the president of Harvard, was really a mentor to her during that leadership time. By the way, I should mention that when they were doing the search that produced Drew Faust. Larry had been at Tufts for maybe four or five years at that point, and his name kept coming up in conversation about Harvard. He had his degrees from Harvard. He was so highly regarded, and it made its way into the Boston Globe that he was being considered by Harvard. This was not a leak from Harvard. This was supposition on the part of people who, who figured out who might be a candidate. And Larry had told them from the beginning he would not be a candidate. He was president of Tufts. He was going to stay at Tufts. There was no question about that in his mind. But it, when it appeared in the Boston Globe, he ended up writing a letter to the Tufts community saying, I just want you to know I am not a candidate. I have never been a candidate. I do not intend to be a candidate. I am the president of this institution, and I'm delighted to be your president. 
So we, we go ahead now a number of years. He's stepped down from Tufts. He's been out of um, the presidency for about five years. He's on the senior governing board at Harvard, the group that is going to choose the next president. And he doesn't have any interest or intention of being president of Harvard. He's going around meeting with lots of us. I've met with him, and many, many people did, and others on the board, to think about the kind of candidate who might be good. And this group is meeting, this senior board of Harvard Corporation is meeting and talking about candidates. And Larry's in the room. And I think over time, people just began to look around the room, and one after another said, oh, my gosh, we have such talent in this room in the person of Larry Bacow. And so to his surprise, they came back at him and asked if he would ever consider this. And it really, he wasn't expecting it. But at that point, he became interested in the challenges that colleges and universities across the country face. He believed he could make a difference, the kinds of things that we've talked about as motivating people to be a president. And it became intriguing to him. And so he stepped off, as it were, the search committee um, and became the candidate um, to whom the job was offered. It came as a surprise to all of us who knew Larry because we hadn't seen it coming. And on the other hand, it felt just right that Larry has this extraordinary opportunity to be someone who has been a president of a different institution and worked at two other institutions in Boston area, MIT and Tufts. So he has an outsider's perspective, but he also is an alum and was on the governing board at Harvard. So in other ways, he has an insider perspective. And at this moment in Harvard's history, that combination is a winning combination. Well, that's a quite, that's quite a story, uh, Judy, and uh, thank you so much for sharing it. I, I guess he's, he's the he's, I can't wait to see how he does. Uh, there's so many challenges, and I guess if we could talk a bit about some of the challenges people face on universities now that uh, you have always the same challenges around the things that we've listed, which is you know understanding the culture, the institution, the management of personnel, the relationships with donors, students, faculty. Those are all standard challenges that come with the job and the mm-hmm. territory. Um, these are difficult times in many ways, and one of the things that I, I know I've, I've talked with Peter a few times about is this idea of free speech on campus as, uh, as mm-hmm. something that's problematic, and um, uh, I, I, I don't know um, how he might approach that or if you had a chance to talk with him about it, but if you could talk a little bit about that kind of an issue, and there's sure. this other one that you and I chatted about before we started the, uh, the recording, which was this idea that... Um, there's also uh, a sense of trying to look back in history and some of the institutions and the artwork and even the sculptures. Uh, there, there are people from the past that had done things that Harvard wanted to recognize and reward. But now, in light of historical, uh, the, the way we look at history differently, that maybe they don't fit so well anymore. Mm-hmm. And there's those kind of challenges that are, I think sort of unique to our times. So, yeah. so I, I, I think both are, are the, the question of, of free speech and academic freedom um, on campuses has been a persistent issue. It's, we had the, uh, you know, the McCarthy era when, when free speech was being questioned and public institutions were putting in place loyalty oaths and anyone who, who um, spoke um, critically was, was questioned. It's emerged again, as a complicated issue, um, because institutions are navigating between important institutional values that are competing, and as as I said earlier, sometimes they conflict with each other, and that is that they want to be places where students learn, and part of learning is being exposed to views that are different from your own, that um, may sit poorly with you, that may be objectionable or certainly um, unfamiliar. And those have been part of the essential, almost sacrosanct values of academia. 
that we will hear differing voices and think about those, critically think about those, and learn about them and end up making our own judgment. On the other hand, we also are deeply concerned about issues of diversity and inclusion, about students who don't feel they belong on the campus, about people who and don't feel they belong because historically they have not been there, and institutions were not receptive to, at one point, women, certainly students from um, uh, who were African American or Hispanic or Asian American, students who were gay, who are gay. I mean, if we look at our our background as institutions, like our background as a society, there have been people who were not admitted or not welcome, um, or who had to um, even sometimes hide who they were. And so we want to be pet places that are welcoming, that are inclusive, where people feel able to learn because they feel, in the language of today, safe. They feel that they can, um, that they are respected. And so controversial speakers can sometimes inflame feelings that these are mongering hate, that they are creating climates that are not conducive to student learning. And so navigating that can be, can be difficult because both are important values, diversity, inclusion, academic freedom, freedom of speech. And so what if those seem to collide? How does one deal with that? And it's becoming an issue. And of course, these become inflamed. One of the major differences between when I started the program in 1990 and now, one of the major differences in presence like has been the um, appearance of social media, of the Internet, of the ability of any small issue on a campus to spread instantly to the wider community and for others to seize upon that and use the institution as their way to get ongoing attention to an issue they care about. And so our institutions can be used as platforms for activists, interest groups, others who aren't really concerned about the institution and may not really be terribly concerned about the controversy on the campus, but see this as a way to to get the attention to a cause they care about. Um, And so whereas in 1990, if something happened, if you had a controversial speaker who came to campus, you might be talking about it on the campus, but it wouldn't within a minute or two be blasted to the world with people then arguing about it and the facts of it being lost somewhere, you know, within 20 minutes becoming something other than what it was. Um, And, um, you know, the ability of a president to be thoughtful and explain the issue carefully to the audience is much more constrained now because the audience That is to say, many outside of the institution may have heard about it before the president does, Um, and certainly before the president and the cabinet can get together and figure out how to proceed. Real challenges for the times, I guess. And the issues you talk about, about the sort of difference between buildings, statues, um, paintings, other kinds of things on campuses that were seen in one light at one time and now have a different kind of symbolism and meaning to people um, are issues that we face throughout our society. And one of the things about higher education is that whatever happens out there finds its way onto our campuses. And our campuses tend to be places where there is an intensity to the undergraduate and even graduate student experience into the life there. If they're residential communities, people live there. And so whatever happens out there finds its way in here. And um, presidents have to be in a place where they can lead individuals in an institution through these very difficult times. We um, One of the things that I, I work with Peter Salve on uh, when when the issue got raised about freedom of speech and he was commenting in the press, I, 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 um, I emailed him and I said, Peter, I wonder if you see the view, the, the, the circumstance of, of um, 
you know, um, freedom of speech in terms of somebody coming on cancer, campus who has a difference uh, in terms of his viewpoints or her viewpoints than many of your students and faculty might, as similar to the, the, the difficulty with um, partisanship that's showing mm-hmm. up in our political lives. And, and um, we ended up having a, a panel discussion about hyperpartisanship on campus that try to address them both. Because mm-hmm. the idea of civil discourse and respectful dialogue and and emotional intelligence to me, because that's where I've spent a lot of my years since Harvard is trying to understand, you know, the, the concept of this radio show, in fact, is, is the idea that if we can be more appreciative of how other people are likely to feel in terms of how we're responding or reacting, um, there's a chance that we might have a more peaceful and civil discussion if we're mm-hmm. paying attention to that. And if we recognize in ourselves when our emotions are boiling up that we have better controls over that in terms of how we respond or react, I think that too helps with the idea of inner peace and outer peace. And you know, the, the, the concept for me is that there's so many challenging situations that are different than when you started out or when I, I did too in terms of the social media, the 24-hour news, you know, that's nonstop, seven Seven days a week and um, the seemingly need to be on one side of an issue or the other as opposed to trying to find ways to work together so mm-hmm. um, anyway I you know is that something that you're I, I didn't see that in your curriculum but in terms of emotionally understanding how to deal with conflict differently is emotional intelligence made it into your curriculum at this point at all I would say it has whether it, it, in many regards, uh, and let me let me personalize this for presidents, and that is to say that they are themselves the subject of so many attacks. You know that that um, the hyperpartisanship comes right in there, right at them, and so not only are they, as you've said beautifully, um, trying to help students and their entire community engage in understanding different points of view and being aware of why people might hold those differing positions and being able to think empathetically and emotional intelligence about what is behind and um uh, at the root of people's differing points of view. But the presidents are the place where people just attack, so that if you have one, po- one, one criticism of the institution, you go at the president. If you have another criticism, and it, although they are attacking the president because she or he is the institutional leader, the living logo, it feels to presidents, it can't help but feel to presidents, as very personal. And how do they have the emotional intelligence themselves to, con- to continue to respond to people, um, to understand where they're coming from at the same time as they are the, the um, uh, they are under attack. I, I use the, the analogy of the diving board. I, one president said to me once, and I've loved this analogy, that she feel, she felt during her presidency as if she were um, the, um, uh, on a car, the, the point um, at which the car's brand um, is, is um, advertised, that she was, was that, um, that decal, as it were, on the front of the car, um, hood ornament. She was the hood ornament on the front of the car. And she said, both I represent to others this institution. I am personally the personal sort of representation of the institution. But the hood ornament, if there's an accident, is the thing that gets damaged first. <laughs> and so uh, this role of, you know, um, of being out there and having this this responsibility for leading an institution in the ways you've described at the same time as you're not being treated with respect. And um, the same people, by the way, will come at you one day and then come to you. I I can't tell you how many presidents I've had tell me that, you know, they'll be in an argument with the faculty and they're just being, you know, berated. And the faculty member will come in the next day and talk about, you know, uh, 
promotion or a raise or <laughs> funds for something else. They didn't see it in their own way, even though the attack felt very personal and was personal in the way it was being presented. They, they, they didn't see the president as the one who's giving out rewards and ask for it. Um, and so, well, that speaks to the back level. Back. Uh, that speaks to the level of emotional intelligence of the faculty member. It's always well, important to consider how you're making some somebody feel in terms of asking them for a favor. <laughs> uh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, but but I do think that presidents themselves have to model a certain kind of behavior right. that becomes difficult to do when you are working, you know, fourteen hour days, seven days a week needing to be on a huge amount of the time and having to navigate this course through, through sometimes quite hostile um, constituents. And yet the ability to step away from that and lead in the ways you're talking about is important. No, it's incredibly, uh, to me, uh, leaders in my, many, many situations, but certainly university presidents at this point, um, you know, being a focal point for any of the, um, you know, the negativity that might be associated with something happening on their campus or some incident that takes place, uh, you know, they, they, they're immediately the focal point for all the negative press that might come out mm-hmm. about it. And then certainly they get attacked on social media as well as in person by people. Mm-hmm. So you got to, I, I think part of that is you have to be able to manage your own emotions so that you don't respond inappropriately because Mm -hmm. at some point you know there's a tipping point at some point that most people either they got to walk away or they're going to say something or do something that Mm -hmm. is regrettable but not necessarily uh, forgotten (laughs) that's right the other issue that's a really important issue today and i think larry backhow did mention this during his inauguration address is the increasing suspicion about what is happening on college campuses and Along with that, maybe the result of that, a decline in, in public support of higher education. People being unsure about how institutions are teaching, or are they coddling students, snowflakes, whatever the language oh, right, might right, be. Right, right. There is a, a, a narrative out there that's really quite negative about colleges and universities, and often so misrepresents what's going on. And I think one of the roles that that Larry feels, and I think all presidents that I talk to feel, is that their job is not to have these one-time incidents that get blown up and out of proportion um, on social media become statements about their institution. You know, so they had a a controversial speaker and some of the students picketed and maybe a few got out of hand and and it was five students and then there was a huge reaction and it suddenly becomes the institution, the students, and higher ed. Um, and the danger of that is really quite serious because an entire industry in our country that is so essential for the successful advancement of this country the education of our future leaders, the development of civic leadership, the research that goes on on our campuses and so forth, to not understand and then to um, blame higher education and withdraw support for it or harshly criticize it um, is, is, you know, quite, quite alarming. And I think there presidents are very much aware that their role today is to articulate what is happening much more clearly and to let people know much more about our colleges and universities than they think they know. Maybe you want to add a, yeah, want to add another objective on your on your program to include public relations. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> In, in six days, we can only add so much, but that's why we have the <laughs> seminar for experienced presidents. So they're coming back to talk about ongoing issues that they're facing. And in this program, which is going to take place in a couple of weeks, one of the topics is, um, is um, leading through controversy, and another is leading change, because our institutions are in different times than they once were, and how do you take traditional institutions and move them ahead to be even more responsive to our current students and our current climate and environment than they have been. 
Well, those are certainly ch- interesting challenges. Judy, we're just about out of time. So anything you want to say in closing about leadership and presidents? Uh, I've really appreciated your time today. I think we've talked about all different angles of it. I love the questions you've asked, and um, I've learned a lot from from the things you said, so thank you. (laughs) Thank you very much, Judy. And maybe periodically over the year, if there are things that are happening that are challenging on campus, I'll give you a call, and maybe you can just talk a little bit about them. Let's do that. Thank you very much. Great catching up with you. Take care, Judy. Bye-bye. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.